what you're looking at is a rotor composed of thin slices of pyrolytic graphite and aluminum, rotating around an arrangement of ferrite and neodymium magnets. Yes, this really is spinning without any outside interference or influence, as near as I can tell. Why do I say that? Well, because I'm holding the rotor by a string. So you first have to rule out the possibility that subtle movements from my hand are preventing the rotor from stabilizing and coming to a stop between the magnetic fields, or inadvertently causing the rotor to spin. Here's a simple example of how you can affect an object simply by thinking about it. If you've never tried this before, I would encourage you to. It's an interesting lesson in how you can affect things around you by what you think about without realizing it. Take a simple washer, tie it to a string, and draw an addition sign on a piece of paper. Pick up the string, and steady the washer on the plus sign. As you lift the string, it will begin spinning on its own, in this case counterclockwise. Try to hold your hand completely still. Begin picturing the washer spinning clockwise around the plus sign. After a few moments, the washer will begin changing its directional spin. You're seeing this up close, so it looks like I'm trying to spin the washer on purpose, but in actuality, my fingers don't feel like they're moving at all. Your brain sends tiny electrical impulses through your fingers that causes what you're picturing in your mind to manifest by subtle movements you don't even feel yourself making. Now picture the washer going up and down, and then side to side. It's much easier to affect something as small as a washer. The rotor is bigger and heavier, so it would be a bit more difficult to do this with something this size. I tested this assembly several times. Each time I tried picturing the rotor changing direction to see if I could be accidentally causing the rotation. It always continued in the same counterclockwise direction, which is the direction in which it should be turning based on how I designed it. Speaking of which, here's a brief description of the materials and principles involved in the assembly. The rotor is composed of pyrolytic graphite, which is diamagnetic, meaning it is repelled by a magnetic field. However, that repulsion is very, very light. And it's also composed of aluminum, which is paramagnetic, so it's very slightly attracted to a magnetic field. Now the reaction of these types of magnetic materials to a magnetic field is so subtle that it's difficult to even test a design like this which is why I use the method of suspending the rotor from a string. The stator assembly is composed of ferrite magnets capped with neodymium magnets. They are alternately placed north-south facing up. If you've seen my videos on the magnetic spin vortex, the alignment of the magnets may make more sense to you. The spin of the magnets arc from the center point of the magnet, so I'm focusing the spins from one side of the magnets on the pyrolytic graphite and aluminum materials on the rotor. By using the larger ferrite magnets below the shorter neodymium magnets, I'm concentrating the other side of the spins away from the rotor. They are drawn more toward the ferrite magnet than the diamagnetic or paramagnetic materials. When the thought first occurred to me of building a magnetic motor years ago, the initial image that came into my imagination was that of two arrangements of magnets shaped like windmills. One with its north poles facing out, the other with its south poles facing out, to be used as a rotor and stator assembly. This was before I had any understanding of the complexities of magnetic field interaction. Whenever I thought about diamagnetic materials, the idea of the windmill would occur to me again though. If you saw my older video on the pyrolytic graphite rotor, you saw this evidenced by the designs I attempted in that video. I wrapped magnets from their north poles facing each other in an attempt to use a technique John Bedini used to focus the magnetic spin on a tighter, less arced path. What I realized later is that the pole of the magnet has to be in a pretty direct path to the face of the pyrolytic graphite to even slightly move it. It's less about the arrangements of magnets to induce spin and more about the angling of the pyrolytic graphite. By placing the face angled with one side slightly further away than the other side, it gives the rotor a path of directional rotation. The technique I used in the other video would have caused the rotor to have to rotate through multiple flux loops, which is why it didn't work. This design works in an even flow of north to south alternating magnetic fields 
graphite is equally repelled by north or south magnetic fields, so it's irrelevant which pole you use. However, facing all poles north or south up would create cluttered fields of flux loops. Orienting them the way I did in this design gives the rotor a smooth series of magnetic spins to ride. By angling the aluminum and graphite the way I did, the rotor glides the spins similar to how a windmill rides the wind. Or at least that's the theory I'm postulating for this design. If you put one together for yourself, feel free to tweak the design. I'm sure there are numerous ways to assemble one of these. I couldn't find a low friction bearing capable of handling the subtleties of pyrolytic graphite, so the string was one way of testing the design. I'm sure there are others. If I allowed this to keep spinning long enough, it would eventually spin so tightly that it would cease rotation because the forces involved aren't very powerful, so a configuration like this couldn't be used to do work. But that's not the point. If it really works the way I believe it does and the principles are studied, it's possible that there may be a way to upscale the design using different materials. And with the right materials, it may be possible to build an assembly based on the principles that does perform work. Which is why I always share my research. The more heads you have working on a problem, the quicker a solution will present itself. Before I put this assembly together, I tested some different materials to determine the correct combination of materials to use in the final design. These are some of the materials that I experimented with. I also decided to demonstrate the setup with candles around the stator, simply so no one thinks I'm using a fan or blower to induce spin in the rotor. It's really not a bad idea to demonstrate your builds this way regardless, as there are quite a few hoaxes out there. For the skeptics, there is nothing under the table. And as an added bonus to my viewers who actually watch my videos to the end, I put together this simple assembly to show that it's actually not my fingers that were inducing rotation in the rotor earlier.
If you're wondering if this will keep spinning perpetually, no, it will eventually wind so tight that it will stop, as I mentioned earlier. The forces involved are too weak to overcome the resistance of the string once it's too tightly wound. Here's the interesting thing, though. If you've ever wound something up on a string before, you know that once it reaches a point that you can't wind it any tighter, it unwinds. And then it'll wind and unwind until it eventually comes to a stop. The rotor didn't do that, though. It ran for about 20 minutes, started to back up in the other direction for a few seconds, and then stopped. In other words, the force of the magnetic fields in the stator were strong enough to hold the angled pyrolytic graphite and aluminum in the rotor in place and prevent it from unwinding. I'd say that's pretty significant. Feel free to build one of these and test it for yourself. I listed the materials I used earlier. It's a pretty simple design and easy to put together. You don't have to use the exact size and types of materials I did. The principles will work regardless as long as you include stronger neodymium magnets in your design. Thanks for watching, and do great things.